Hello, Hello citizens, citizens of the, the world. world. We, we are, are anonymous. anonymous. Guess what world? We are back. Everywhere you look, corruption. We continue to fight pointless wars over lies, and we are killing innocents and letting our children die in wars just to ensure the Federal Reserve can continue our petrodollar scandal. We are sitting idly by while these crooks continue to loan fake money out to us at interest, stealing our homes, and enslaving our children. Let me make this extremely clear to all of you listening. Many corporations, especially the Federal Reserve used the government to steal $17 trillion from your children. Your children did not have that money. They are now debt slaves. These people have stolen money from your children that are not even born yet, and sold their freedoms. They have enslaved you and many around the world. Wake up world. And they did all of this by counterfeiting money and loaning it out at an interest. They have stolen hundreds of trillions from people around the world. Have you heard about Microsoft's Xbox manufacturers in China? They had to install suicide nets outside their buildings to ensure their employees don't jump out of the window to commit suicide. These are the conditions your children in the U.S. will be working under when the debt is soon owed, and it will be owed. It is not a matter of if it will be owed but it is just a matter of when. And it will happen as soon as the United States economy collapses, which will happen very very soon. And if you think because you do not live in the United States this does not affect you, you are wrong. And you are next. The only way we can stop this is if we all unite together and fight it. People of the U.S. are waking up to the Federal Reserve scandal. And the powers that be are currently afraid of retaliation. And that is precisely why they trying everything they can to disarm us. You know how the media has been saying gun violence has been out of control and at an all-time high. They are not simply twisting the truth here or exaggerating. They are absolutely boldface presenting lies to you. First off realize, gun violence in the United States has always been shockingly low. And gun violence has dropped by 49% in the last 11 years. The already already absurdly low gun violence in America has literally dropped in half. In half. The fact they are saying that it is at an all-time high perfect demonstrates how biased the government and the media is. If this doesn't prove to you that they have an agenda, then nothing will. Do you remember how the media keeps repeating that there has been 74 school shootings since Sandy Hook? Those 74 shootings were not even mass shootings like they claim. Most were suicides and none of them even took place at a school. Not a single one. They are presenting lies to you America. When will you wake up? At some point you have to ask yourself why would the government fake 74 mass school shootings involving children? If they get our guns, we will lose the fight against them. And they will take away absolutely all of your freedoms and you and your children will be forever slaves. And don't forget they purposefully put you and your children into that debt. And because the Federal Reserve is present in all countries, the other countries of the world are next soon after. This plan is called the New World Order. It is the same New World Order the Vice President of the United States called for on national TV a month ago. He said we need to strive for and complete the New World Order. This is also the same New World Order President George Bush, and President Kennedy said is our country's lifetime goal. And the same New World Order George Bush said on national TV said will happen no matter what we do, and we cannot prevent it. This has all been a long time plan. The Federal Reserve and their partners want complete control of humanity. We cannot let this happen. They want to rule over us, like kings and queens. And humanity will be forever lost to enslavement by a bunch of tyrants who have publicly admitted they want to kill off the majority of the population so the masses are easier to control. They are going to wipe your bloodline completely off of the earth. He'll tell you the order of things to happen. The enslavement will follow immediately after guns are taken away and you cannot fight back. If they cannot get the guns before the economic collapse, then they will wait until the economy collapses. When the economy collapses people will be starving. There will be looters and shootings. The government will insist on taking guns away to help, and as soon as the guns are taken away then we will fall into a complete dictatorship. Do not fall for it. Remember, 
They are the ones who caused the economic collapse to begin with. This is the same tactic used on Germans and it worked. So expect it. As soon as the economy collapsed and the masses were starving the German government asked the people to give up their rights and they listened. And then eventually the government was throwing the naked masses into intergiant burning hot ovens for mass execution. Do not give up your rights. Do not give up your guns. Fight back as they were the ones who caused the problem. Just so you know the people who are behind this Federal Reserve scam and New World Order, are the same ones who funded Hitler's campaign. Make no mistake, these people bit as brutal as Hitler himself, even more brutal, in fact. Now we are going to show you some. Assuming America grows some balls and we win, we will need an overall plan. We have come up with a perfect plan. This plan offers extraordinary possibilities. It will make for the most beautiful and free world you can ever imagine. If we are successful we can leave a much better for our children. A beautiful world. Watch every minute of the rest of the video. Do not skip a single bit of it, as it is all important. If this one video gets out to and can change the world, this is your opportunity to make a difference. Please share this video. What you want with it get paid for the views. We don't care. Just get the message out there for the world to see. Now sit back and relax enjoy the movie. To you. Makes perfect sense. Okay. Anybody else want to throw anything out at us? Sir? Uh, I think you're an anarchist and you don't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Do, do you hear me denying anything? <laughs> Many people, when they hear the word anarchy, think of chaos and mayhem. So, they assume that an anarchist must be in favor of disorder and violence. That is the complete opposite of the truth. Most objections and complaints about the anarchist or voluntarist philosophy are not actually about the philosophy itself, but result from people misunderstanding what the philosophy is all about. To illustrate a few points, we will use the example of two fictional islands. Authoritania, where there is a ruling class or government, and anarchia, where there is no ruling class of any kind. We will use these islands to examine several common misconceptions about anarchism. Lots of people think anarchy means every man for himself, or survival of the fittest, or the absence of any social cooperation or organization. They think that anarchy means everyone has to be self-sufficient. This comes from the false assumption that some kind of government is necessary for any organization to occur. Whether it's part of a republic, a democracy, a kingdom, or a dictatorship, a ruling class issues orders called laws and punishes anyone who disobeys them. That is not cooperation. That's domination. It's one group forcing its will on another. Authoritarianism can be used to force people into organized patterns but that does not mean that people are incapable of organizing their activities without being forced. The most productive and useful examples of organization that we see today are anarchistic in nature. No one was forced to build the grocery store you go to. No one was forced to produce or sell anything in it. Everyone involved in the vastly complex operation of growing your food transporting it, displaying it in the store, and selling it to you, everyone involved participates voluntarily, working in exchange for money. You and all the other store customers choose freely which store to go to and what to spend your money on. This purely voluntary arrangement allows for an amazingly complex degree of organized cooperation without anyone being coerced to participate. In contrast, under government, a very small group of people comes up with an idea and forces everyone else to participate in it and provide for its funding with tax dollars. 
In the authoritarian version of a supermarket, the ruling class would tell people what to produce and how much, what prices to charge, and they would tell customers what they must buy and what they must pay. Anyone who did not comply with the centralized master plan would be punished in some way. That is how government does things. Which one of these would you prefer? Another common but incorrect assumption is that if there were no ruling class or no government, people would have no way of defending themselves against common criminals or foreign invaders. Again, this is simply not true. The government version of protection is inherently hypocritical. Governments will use their hired law enforcers to find and lock up some of the private thugs and thieves and prevent them from preying on people. But every ruling class gets the money for its operations by way of taxation, demanding money from its subjects and punishing those who don't pay up. Oddly, every ruling class insists that it needs to be able to forcibly control and extort money from people in this way in order to protect them from private criminals who might try to forcibly control and extort them. In contrast, if there is no government, people do not lose their inherent right to defend themselves from violence or to defend what they have from those who would take it. Every person has this right, and they also have the right to organize and cooperate with each other to exercise that right. Organizing for mutual defense does not require any government-granted laws or authority. No one wants to be attacked or defrauded, and everyone wants to feel safe. Whether each person takes this on himself or herself individually, or whether they hire and organize others to do it on their behalf, it can be done on a voluntary basis. Those who insist that government is necessary often claim that if there wasn't a government, then smaller private gangs would spring up to enslave and rob people. Organized crime gangs exist along with government, and most people do not understand the dynamics between them and how government enriches and empowers organized crime while appearing to fight it. Black markets enrich organized crime, and money allows them to buy government protection. There's no reason to think they would do as well in an environment of freedom where they would have fewer ways to make money and would be up against both individual and organized armed citizens. A criminal gang that's recognized as such has far less power than a gang whose aggression is perceived to be legitimate and proper. And that's the gang we call government. When thuggery is called law enforcement, and thievery is called taxation, and self-defense is called crime and terrorism, then even the widespread ownership of firearms can't do much to stop the aggression. Imagine a private gang trying to do the things that government does without the aura of authority, and imagine how a well-armed population would respond to this. The gang would fail quickly and dramatically. Another concern that people have when they first consider the idea of a stateless society is that some people are truly malicious, destructive, and sociopathic. The concern is that these people would be free to do anything they wanted and no one would stop them. But this concern is again based on a basic misunderstanding of human nature. Wherever we have a government ruling class, we still have freelance thieves and thugs who are not deterred by the laws of the politicians. In some instances, they're stopped by force by the police or they decide not to commit a crime for fear of what the police might do to them. What makes this deterrence work is not the legislation or the official badges, but the simple threat of harm to the sociopath. It really makes no difference whether the threat comes from the police or another citizen or even another criminal. A sociopath doesn't care about laws or social rules. He cares about avoiding pain and hardship for himself. This is still true when a government ruling class is not involved at all. 
If the intended target of a would-be carjacker pulls out a gun, it doesn't make any difference to the carjacker whether that person has a badge or whether there's a law against taking people's cars. Discouraging nasty people from hurting others does not require special authority, only the ability to use defensive force. Ironically, though people hope that government will protect them, having a government, a gang which is believed to have the right to tax and control people, just creates one gang so big and powerful that normal people can't resist it. In short, to create a huge gang and then give it societal permission to control and extort people with the hope that this gang will prevent theft and thuggery is simply a self-contradictory idea, but that's what government always is. Some people might assume that if people organize for mutual protection and defense, then that's what government is. But there's an essential difference. People coming together to do something that everyone has the right to do, such as defend yourself, doesn't require any special authority. It's not government unless one group of people claims the right to do things which others do not have the right to do, such as taxing and controlling innocent people. Organized defense can be very effective without supposing the special right to rule over others, in other words, without being government. In contrast, governments rob the people they rule of far more wealth than private crooks could ever manage, making the idea of a protector government ridiculous. Another common objection to the idea of a stateless society is the notion that if not for a group of lawmakers telling the rest of us how to behave, we would all behave like stupid, irresponsible, violent animals. This claim implies one of two things. Either we normal people have no idea what is right and wrong unless and until politicians tell us, or the only reason we want to do the right thing and coexist peacefully is because politicians told us to. A quick examination of your own motivations will show you that neither of those things is actually true. It's particularly odd to make this argument in a society where politicians are voted into power. If the people themselves have no moral code and no conscience, and are just stupid, violent animals, why does almost everyone want government to keep the peace and protect the innocent? Would a population of vicious, heartless, evil people try to elect good people to keep the evil people in line? Obviously not. The goodness and the desire for order and peace comes from us, not from the lawmakers we vote into office. The same holds true of everything the government does. If people are so short-sighted and selfish that they can't be trusted to voluntarily organize and raise money for whatever they deem important, then how can those same people be trusted to decide who should be in power? The implication is that the average person can't be trusted to run his own life, but can be trusted to choose someone to run other people's lives. Government is really not a civilizing influence. It's actually an uncivilizing influence. People who would never personally rob their neighbors constantly use the government to do it for them by way of taxation. People who would never dream of trying to control minute details of their neighbors' lives think it's just fine to vote for politicians to do it instead. Government gives everyone the opportunity and encouragement to rob and control other people without risk. So government, rather than serving as a check against the imperfections of our nature, instead drastically amplifies our greed, irresponsibility, and malice towards other human beings by giving us a legally acceptable and risk-free way to interfere with the lives and choices of our fellow men and women. Government brings out the criminal and busybody in everyone. In contrast, in the absence of a ruling class, people would lose their ability to ask lawmakers to interfere with their neighbors' lives. And we would not have law enforcers who could avoid responsibility for evil deeds 
by claiming that they were just following orders. Throughout history, far more theft, assault, oppression, and even murder has been committed by those acting on behalf of a supposed authority than by anybody else. Even basically good people, when they believe in government, will condone things or do things which they know would be wrong if they did them on their own. Most people know that theft and assault are bad, but they imagine that controlling their neighbors and forcing them to spend their money on things they don't want is perfectly moral and legitimate when it's done by way of the political process. Wrong becomes right when it's called taxation, legislation, regulation, and war. Anarchists know better. They know that human society will never be perfect, but it would be a whole lot better if evil deeds were committed only by genuinely nasty sociopathic people rather than being committed wholesale by basically good people who think that violent aggression is okay when it's called law enforcement. The fundamental principle of voluntarism is very simple. It's wrong to initiate violence against any other person, regardless of badges, laws, or alleged authority. The only time the use of force is justified is to defend against aggression. Almost everyone understands this on a personal level, but they've been taught that this basic rule of social living does not apply in the game of politics and government. Most people already know how to get along with others, and most people want a peaceful and just society. Our morality doesn't come from politicians making laws. Our ability to organize and cooperate doesn't come from the ruling class. When people escape the belief in government, they don't suddenly turn into violent animals. Our inherent right to defend ourselves and our ability to defend ourselves is not served by government. In fact, it's threatened by government more than by anything else. Ruling classes do not produce peaceful coexistence, but rather perpetual conflict and violence. Our belief in government authority takes our compassion, virtue, and good intentions and turns them into power for people who crave power and riches. Of course the people who benefit most from the political racket will put a good spin on the system and do their best to convince people that it's a social necessity. But ask yourself this, have the thousands of laws, regulations, and taxes imposed on you by politicians made you a better person? Have they made you more productive or more caring? Is the world better off with the politicians taking your money and telling you how to live your life? Or do you think it might have been better off if you'd been allowed to spend your own money and make your own decisions? Is society really best served by a small class of people forcefully imposing a centralized master plan on everyone else? Can the orders and threats of a ruling class make the world what it should be? Or would society be better served by human freedom and respect for individual rights, by voluntary cooperation and peaceful organization? If this second option sounds better to you, maybe you should learn more about anarchism. Some people dismiss anarchism as a utopian idea that would only work if everyone were generous and compassionate. Obviously, everyone is not generous and compassionate all the time. But these people need to look at the other side of the coin. If people are too stupid, greedy, and malicious to be free, aren't they too stupid, greedy, and malicious to be trusted with power over others? Whether people are inherently good, bad, or some of each, giving a person power over others is not going to make that person better. In fact, power has historically been known to corrupt people and make them worse, whereas the discipline imposed by the equal freedom of everyone else brings out the best in human nature. Most people today think that we need some form of government because they mistakenly believe that obedience to authority makes us all more civilized, moral, and peaceful. In reality, it has always done exactly the opposite. 
Everyone knows that governments can be corrupt, abusive, inefficient, counterproductive, even tyrannical. But most people assume that the way to fix that is to get the right people into power. People have spent centuries trying to create a good society using different kinds of ruling classes, different legal structures, different ways of choosing the rulers, and so on. But every governmental construction has resulted in freedom and riches for some, and oppression, violence, and poverty for others. What if, instead of deciding what the throne should look like and who should sit on it, all people of goodwill embraced the non-aggression principle? What if, instead of looking to a ruling class to impose our values on society, we embrace the concept of self-ownership. These principles are simple and easy, to the point of being self-evident, but they're diametrically opposed to the authoritarian principles that most of us have been indoctrinated with. Anarchism does not mean chaos and violence, or every man for himself. Having no government does not mean having no morality, no organization, and no cooperation. Simply put, anarchism does mean that no one is your master and no one is your slave. And that's all it means. Howdy, Larkin Rose here. Uh, I'm feeling slightly less than entirely patient and polite today, so if this video gets slightly caustic, uh, too bad. This video is for all the people who are constantly saying, well, if not for government, we couldn't have roads, or we couldn't have police, or nobody would care for the poor, or we, couldn't, we wouldn't be protected, whether it's from, from local thugs or from, from foreign invaders. We wouldn't have this, we wouldn't have that. So thank goodness we have government and taxes, because we wouldn't have any of those things. And the first way I'd respond to that is by pointing out the assumptions that underlie that complaint, that, that, that argument. Basically what people are saying, because let's be clear about what the terms mean, government is the people who boss everybody else around. And taxes are those people demanding money from us. So they basically tell us, hand over a whole bunch of money and we'll decide how to take care of you. We'll decide how to spend your money. Uh, if we don't like it too bad, we don't really have a choice. Like, well, you can vote in a few years and maybe something will change, even though it totally won't. So that's what people are saying. Basically, if we didn't have a ruling class stealing our money and then supposedly spending it to protect us, how could we possibly have roads or anybody to protect us? The implication is that in this country, for example, 300 million people would just sit around thinking, oh, we just we can't do it. Without politicians and tax collectors, we can't have a road, we can't protect each other, and we can't... And it, it rests on this bizarre assumption that things that almost everybody wants, they wouldn't do anything to make happen unless there were politicians forcing us to give them money so they can make it happen. And so an example I like to use is let's apply the same argument to food, because food is pretty darn important. I think everybody can agree. Let's apply the same argument that, that statists use about the roads or caring for the poor or protection or anything like that. The argument would go like this. Now, in the context of food, listen how idiotic this is. If we don't have government demanding money from all of us under the threat of caging us, and that's what taxation is, here's the money you have to give us, here's the nasty things we do to you if you don't. If that didn't happen so that they could build a big food production and distribution system and feed us, well, we'd all starve. We'd all just sit around saying, gosh, I wish we had food, but you know, no politicians and tax collectors. Uh, we're just going to sit around and starve to death. Now, in this country, nobody would believe something that stupid because all you have to do is go to a supermarket and see a perfect example of really efficient, organized cooperation that nobody is forced to do. There is no, you know, if you're going to make the argument that people make about roads and, and, and protection and all that, you'd say, well, nobody is forced to make any food for anybody in this country. How do you know everyone's just going to say, well, it's not my job, and we'll all starve to death. There's no guarantee. There's no master plan guaranteeing 
that we'll all have food. So obviously we're all going to starve if we don't have an authoritarian government stealing our money and then making food and giving it to us. Because golly gee, we couldn't possibly do it voluntarily ourselves. Again, in this country, nobody makes that argument because they see it happening voluntarily. Nobody involved is, is forced to do that. Nobody is forced to make you a single bite of food. There is no guarantee at all from anybody. And yet, Americans are, by and large, hugely overweight. Obviously, we don't have a lack of food. We might have a lack of healthy food. But obviously, we see that example, oh, we can handle that. You know, voluntarily, mutual cooperation, that's fine for food, but for some reason, it's not okay, and we can't even fathom the idea of the exact same thing handling roads or handling protecting us or other things that almost everybody wants. So there's in the question is this bizarre assumption that everybody will sit around really, really, really wanting something, but because there aren't politicians bossing us around and stealing our money, well, how could we possibly do it? And one of the most common things is who will build the roads, which is amazingly stupid to me, just amazingly stupid. I have here in my pocket a little tiny thing. With this little tiny thing, I can be most places in this country and call people all over the world. And I own it myself. I'm not anywhere near rich these days, but I own one. Almost everybody I know has one of these, a little thing that can fit in your pocket and just on a whim, you can open it and talk to somebody who's on the other side of the planet. And there was no coercion, nobody forced anybody to make one of these. This is the result of voluntary cooperation. And that's it, free trade. Organization, yeah, good. Cooperation, yeah, good. Coercion, which is what government is, and taxation, which is theft, didn't need that to do this. So what these people are telling me, oh, we wouldn't have roads if we didn't have government is that somehow free individuals, relatively free, interacting voluntarily can make it so I can talk to almost anybody in the world on a little thing that fits in my pocket on a budget that is not a very good budget at the moment, but I still have one of these. That freedom, not authoritarianism, can supply me with this, but freedom cannot achieve a flat place because that's what a road is. It's a flat place from here to there because we have these machines that take us from here to there. By the way, we don't have those machines because of government. We have those machines because of free enterprise and voluntary interaction and cooperation. The idea that freedom can make a car but can't make a flat place is just idiotic. You really think we can't make a flat place? And, and so I ask people and they say, well, we'll build roads. Are you really telling me that you really and truly think that if government fell off the face of the earth, 300 million people in this country, 7 billion if you want to include the whole planet, would sit around in their houses thinking, golly, I wish I could go visit Fred, but eh, I can't because there's not a flat thing for me to him. And I don't know how to do it. And the other 300 million or 7 billion people, we can't possibly do it because there aren't any politicians and tax collectors. If they were here, we could do it. If they were here to boss us around and steal our money and really inefficiently build a flat place, then we'd be set. Then I'd be comfortable and I could be confident that I could get places. I could visit Fred. I could go shopping. But now we're all going to sit in our houses wishing we could go to the corner store, but we can't because, golly, how could we possibly make a flat place from here to there? We can make these where you can talk to anybody in the world. We can make machines that you drive around in, but no, we couldn't possibly make a flat place. And when people say, well, who will build the roads? The first answer is the same damn people who do it now. Politicians and tax collectors don't build the friggin' roads. Have you ever seen one out there? No, you haven't. They steal our money, waste most of it, do all their corrupt games, and then they pay other people. Here's an idea. How about if we pay those other people who actually build the stinking road? And the fact that that doesn't occur to people is a great indication of how well indoctrinated people are by the rulers who will perpetually tell us, you can't organize anything, you can't achieve anything, you can't do anything unless we are here to force it on you. And it's, again, there are a zillion examples, whether it's caring for the poor or protection or roads, obviously. 
where most of the population will say, I'm really concerned that poor people won't be taken care of, which means most of the population wants people in need to be taken care of. And if we didn't have politicians stealing our money, how would it happen? Here's an idea. Take some money out of your pocket and give it to one of the people that you think needs help. Why would you not comprehend that, but you would comprehend some guy a thousand miles away passing a law to send an armed thug to take your money, to waste 90% of it, and then give a little bit to somebody who may just be defrauding the system or may actually need it. And the amount of indoctrination required to make people even ask these questions of how could we possibly do this without government? What do you think government adds to the equation? It doesn't add any resources. It doesn't create anything. Everything it gives away, it steals from us first by way of taxation. It doesn't add any skills. It doesn't add any knowledge. The people who are here would still be here if the institution of government fell over. We have all the know-how, we have all the resources, all the technology. The only thing it adds is one group that's imagined to have the right to violently assault and control and extort everybody else. So what the question really means is, how can we have a road, or how could I help that poor, or how could that poor person be helped, or how would anybody protect us if there wasn't a gang of thugs with permission to violently control and rob us? And when you recognize that that is literally what the question means, you already see how utterly idiotic it is. And it's completely the result of authoritarian status indoctrination. Nobody would come up, on, come up with that on their own. And, and you obviously don't see that with the example of food or cars or cell phones or anything else. Nobody says, we won't be able to talk to each other unless there's a gang of thugs that's around, allowed to boss us around and steal our money. And just economically, how stupid you have to be to think that's a good idea. Here are your choices. Let's do this. I'll give you these two choices for how you will be fed from now on. Either you can go spend your own money wherever you want. You can get a supermarket or local this or the local grocery, whatever you want. You can go decide what you want and they'll tell you the price. You decide what you're going to buy and how much. And, and you can go to different places and you can shop around and you can do all that. That's option number one. But let me warn you, option number one does not give any guarantee that you will be fed. There's no master plan forcing people to feed you. So, oh my gosh, you better be really scared of that option, despite the fact that you can do it day after day and it works really darn well and feeds pretty much not only this country, but with a massive surplus. So that's option number one that apparently statists are scared of. Option number two is politicians will take as much money of yours as they decide to take. Then they will decide what, if anything, they will buy with that money in terms of food to give to you, to feed you. Do you really think that will serve you better, that that will feed you better? Yeah, I'm much more comfortable that I'll have a, a you know, I'll, I'll be fed, I'll be secure, everything will be okay if a gang of thugs, who doesn't really care about me, steals my money and then decides what, if anything, to give me back from what they stole. But that is implied in the question, whatever you put in the blank, you know, how are we going to have blank if not for government? What you're saying is, how can we, the people who really want roads and food and cell phones and protection and all the things that almost everybody wants, how can we possibly have that unless we give someone permission to steal our money and boss us around and then decide what they're going to give us? And the same thing applies no matter what you put in the, the blank. How will we possibly do blank without government? Um, one of the silly ones is, is caring for the poor. How will we care for the poor? Think of what that means. Like people, it, when more than half the country votes for a party to take care of the poor, it's more than half of the country saying, we're really concerned and we want to make sure that the less fortunate are taken care of, but we don't believe that normal people acting in freedom will take care of them. Well, if the people didn't care about the poor, they wouldn't win the election. By definition, if you vote for a welfare state, you're an idiot. Because either people are heartless bastards and you're going to lose, or people are compassionate in giving, and you don't need to win. Just give them your stinking money. But people play the game, and that's the Democratic Party lives off of the idiotic notion 
that you're all so heartless that you should vote for us to steal your money to give to the poor. And half the country falls for it. Yeah, we're all so heartless that we voted you into office for the specific purpose of taking our money to help the less fortunate. That's just freaking brilliant. How about if half the country just gave their stinking money to the less fortunate? And then the less fortunate would all be rich because it would be a trillion times more efficient than the government version of, of welfare ever is. Also, it would be actual charity instead of mass theft and corruption and fraud and all that fun stuff. But what takes the cake, the ultimately insane thing, you know, whatever you put in that gap, how can we have blank without a parasitic ruling class and a bunch of hired thieves? It's just a stupid question, but it's extra super stupid when what's in the blank is how will we be protected? Who will protect us from thieves and robbers if we don't have government? It's the most idiotic question. It's also the most frequent question from statists. So here's what the question literally means. If we don't give a certain gang of people permission to violently control us and take our money under threat of putting us in a cage, who will protect us from people who might commit aggression against us and take our money? Wanting government for that is exactly as brilliant as saying, we have to have a carjacker in our town, otherwise somebody might steal our cars. Government is an appointed thief. If you don't think taxation is theft, first of all, you're a really well-trained slave. Second of all, try not paying. See what happens. See if they say, oh, that's quite all right. Or if they say, no, you're going to pay or we're going to take your stuff or eventually we'll put you in a cage. And when people say, that's not theft, because we get something back. Learn to think. And I use this example all the time and all I ever get is stupid looks from statists in response. If I robbed you at gunpoint, of a hundred bucks and the next day I gave you a sandwich and you said what? I said hey now everything's fine because you benefited I gave you a, a service I, I gave you lunch so that retroactively makes it okay that I robbed you at gunpoint would you buy that argument? No you'd say that doesn't make it okay okay you gave me a sandwich and yet every status makes the exact same argument when it comes to government will we get some stuff for it after they demand our money under threat of violence and putting us in a cage. Then we get services or goods. We don't get what we asked for, and we get lots of things we didn't ask for, but we kind of get something, and that retroactively makes it okay for them to say, give us this much of every paycheck you make, or we're sending men with guns to take your property. And the slaves justify their own enslavement. I'm proud to pay my taxes. I'm proud to get robbed by a parasitic ruling class and get a little bit back and feel good about it. Like, not only is that legitimate and justified, but I feel proud that I let myself get robbed by a bunch of crooks and parasites. But again, the ultimate thing is protection. When people say, who will protect us from aggressors and thugs and thieves if we don't have a government? Even though what government is, by its very nature, is a gang of aggressors and thugs and thieves. They issue commands, every law they pass is a command backed by a threat of violence. You have to do this, you're not allowed to do that. Here are the nasty things we will do to you if you, are get, if you get caught disobeying. I mean, everybody knows that, even though it's, they don't usually say it in terms that blunt and honest and accurate. But to say we need taxes to be protected is as stupid as you can get. It's saying we need theft to avoid theft. And the fact that people are trained to use different words so that this theft sounds okay. It's legalized. It's taxation. And we voted for the people who robbed us. Like, we got to elect our local carjacker. And that means he represents us when he demands our car and points a gun in our face. He's serving us as he steals our car because he's going to use that car and sell it and make money to make sure nobody else steals our car. That is the essence of government. And the fact that you have hundreds of millions of victims of that scam vehemently defending it and saying, I, I'm not going to give that up. I don't want to give up government. Who would protect us? I don't want to give up the biggest aggressor on the planet, the biggest thief on the planet. Look at your tax bill and see how much private crooks steal from you. So before you ask that question, before you ask, how could we possibly have roads or protection or water or air or 
Christmas or Santa Claus or any of the zillion things that statists imagine we can't possibly have without a, a ruling class, think about what the question actually means. Because when you get to the point where you understand the implications of your own question, asking how can we possibly have this without a parasitic gang of thugs robbing us, when you actually understand what you're really asking, you won't ask the question because you will realize it's completely freaking idiotic. Hey, Larkin Rose here. Uh, one of the first things that people are concerned about when they start thinking about a society without a ruling class is, well, what happens to the nasty people? Uh, whether you're talking about people who are just kind of negligent or inconsiderate, uh, play their music too loud at night or leave their trash lying around the woods or whatever it is, um, all the way up to people who run around attacking and murdering people. So people say, well, well what would happen to them? What would we do about that? Uh, some people even go so far as to say, if not for government, there would be nothing to stop people from committing murder and, and doing whatever other nasty stuff. And it's funny because when somebody says that, there would be no consequences, they could do whatever they wanted and nobody would stop them. The person saying that is implying that he isn't going to do anything. If there's someone running around attacking and murdering innocent people, the guy who said nothing will happen to them, obviously he's not going to do anything or something would happen to them. But not only is he demonstrating his own cowardice when he said there would be nothing to stop murderers, he's also projecting his own immaturity and irresponsibility onto the rest of the world because he's also saying the other 7 billion people wouldn't do anything about it, which obviously isn't true. I would, wouldn't you? If somebody was running around murdering your neighbors, would you just go, well, there aren't politicians and there's nobody with a badge and we don't have tax collectors and bureaucrats, so, oh well, I guess they're just out of luck, they're going to get murdered. Uh, and would, would you not even protect yourself if there wasn't government? Obviously, lots and lots of people, all the same people, would do whatever they could to protect themselves and, and defend the innocent. Uh, to, so to say nothing would happen is just really bizarre. And it comes from having a mentality, basically, of a little kid in a classroom where the teacher walks out of the room and the kids are just sitting there, we don't know what to do. No authority is telling us what to do. And Johnny's throwing things at me, and there's no teacher to stop him! Ah! Because most people, having been trained into authoritarian mentality, it never occurs to them that they are the ones who should fix anything, who should stop anything. And so when people say, well, what would be done about this and that and the other thing, nasty people doing nasty things, um, the first the first thing I ask is, well, what would you do about it? Because people are so into the mentality that there has to be some, that there has to be some master plan and some authority who writes down the law of here is what will be done with those people, that people don't think in terms of, well, what would I do about it? Which is why I always ask people, well, what would you do about it? You're a person just as much as me and just as much as the other seven billion. What would you feel justified in doing if somebody was polluting? or playing their music too loud at night, or running around murdering people, or whatever in between you can think of. Any nasty thing, what would you feel justified in doing about it? Because there's a very basic rule of being a moral human being, which is, if it would be wrong for you to do something, don't ask anybody else to do it. And the rule is so simple, so self-evident and obvious that most people will go, well, duh, of course. Trouble is, nobody in the world who believes in government abides by that rule. Nobody, I don't care if you're a constitutionalist, Democrat, Republican, fascist, communist, anything, any kind of statist, there is nobody who believes in government who abides by the most basic rule of morality, which is if it's wrong for you to do something, don't ask somebody else to do it. Because every single candidate, every party, every government always does things that the voters know they themselves have no right to do. And to say something like, well, I'm voting for the guy who's going to tax you less, well, do you have the right to rob me a little bit less than the other guy? No, you don't. So telling me that, well, somebody was going to rob you more, but I voted for the guy to rob you a little bit less. You are still violating the basic rule of being a human being. If it's wrong for you, don't ask somebody else to do it. Uh, well, that's kind of the second basic rule, the first one being the non-aggression principle. And they actually go together quite well. But 
when people are in the mindset that there's going to be some major centralized plan to, to deal with whatever, polluters or people who play their music too loud or murderers or whatever else, they have to get out of that mindset. They have to start to think that maybe they are among the people who have to do something about it. So instead of setting what will be done about such and such, well, what will you do about it? What should I do about it? And this doesn't, this doesn't magically make all the problems go away, but the actual practical challenge of dealing with most disputes is trivial compared to the challenge of getting people to think like responsible adults, where they start to think, well, maybe it's up to me. And a while back I did uh, little events called uh, Escaping the Myth, and one of the little mental exercises I did with these little groups of people is, imagine we're on an island, and we're it. There's no government, there's no authority, there's nobody with a badge, and one of us is running around stealing stuff from other people. He's not killing anybody, but he's stealing stuff. What are we going to do about it? We normal people. There's not a legislature, there's not 911 to call, there's nobody with a badge, it's just people. And so with that specific example, I would ask people, so what do we do? And just off the top of their heads, everybody comes up with solutions that are way better than what government ever does. First of all, every government solution is, all right, step one, I get to rob everybody. That's the government solution. Well, we're going to tax everybody so we have the resources to stop that other robber. Well, in the island scenario, nobody is stupid enough or insane enough to start with that, to say, well, let's see, so somebody's stealing our stuff. Okay, first, I get to rob all of you so that I have the resources to protect you from him. Nobody is that insane. Everybody is insane enough to believe that who believes in government. And I did for many years. I was stupid enough to actually think that it was rational and moral to advocate mass extortion in order to protect people. And that's just stupid. So I just believed something insanely stupid for a very long time. Most of the world still believes that. But in a setting where people are, are put on the spot and they're responsible for what happens, they don't do that. They don't say, well, I get to boss everybody around and take their money. Nobody does that. So to me, the challenge is not even coming up with specific solutions to every imaginable uh, dispute or problem, which I don't pretend to know how everything's going to turn out. And I don't intend to be emperor of anarchy. I'm not going to be in charge of the world. But getting people to the mindset where it's up to them, where there's just people, we're it. No legislatures, no people with badges, no authority. We're just people. Suddenly people are way better at solving problems and making things work. Uh, one good example is when there's a, a disaster. Unfortunately, um, sometimes it takes a horrendous event to bring out the best in people. And it brings out the worst in some people too. But when people say, whoa, my neighbor's house is floating away, I'm not going to wait for FEMA. I'm not going to dial 911. I'm going to jump in a boat and go save him because suddenly it's on me. Suddenly I'm the one who has to do something. And when people, when it occurs to people that they're the ones who have to do something, and unfortunately usually that only happens in a complete disaster area, when it occurs to people and they suddenly take on the responsibility and start to think like adults, their solutions are generally a lot better than any government solutions and ever are. But to get to that mentality, people have to shift from the authoritarian mindset to the mindset of a self-owning individual who realizes there is nothing above me. There is no magic unicorn who's going to come to save the day, who's going to come save me from, from polluters or somebody playing their music too loud or murderers or whatever it is. It's just us. And if we realize that, then first of all, people would stop asking me, well, without a government, how would this be handled? As if I'm going to be in charge. I don't freaking know. What would you do about it? I could tell you what I would do about it. I could tell you what I might suggest, what I might predict, but who cares? I'm one of seven billion people. I'm not going to be in charge any more than you are. So it's really a mental exercise that people have to think, think over in their own heads with their own moral codes instead of waiting for some outside answer. And it's why I don't usually get into those discussions of, well, here's my plan for how to deal with this and that and the other thing, because my plan doesn't matter. My plan will not be the best plan for any problem you can come up with there will be a million people with better plans than whatever I could come up with. So don't ask me to describe how you are going to fix problems. I don't freaking know. And you can see the mind shift 
um, in people when they they grasp that they own themselves and they suddenly realize, oh, okay, well, yeah, there are things we can do to settle disputes, to protect ourselves from attackers, to do this or that or the other thing. But the first step is just grow up. Stop thinking it's somebody else's business to make the world work. Well, how will the poor be cared for? I don't know. What are you going to do? Well, how will we be protected from this? I don't know. What are you going to do about it? And there is, it is inconvenient. It's inconvenient to be a free person where you can't just be a kid in the classroom whining to the teacher to save the day and fix everything and make everything work, where you actually have to be a responsible adult. And that's one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why people like the belief in authority, because then they can live with the lie that all they have to do is obey and do as they're told and everything will be okay. First of all, no, it won't be okay. Second of all, you're not even being a human being. You just threw your free will out the window and became somebody's slave in the hopes that that would help humanity. It doesn't help humanity for you to be a slave. It doesn't help humanity for everybody else to be a slave. It does help humanity for you to start thinking as an adult, responsible human being who owns himself and who accepts that it is your responsibility to figure out how to make the world work. You cannot begin to imagine in how many ways the world is the opposite of what you have been taught to believe. You see the guy who sells drugs to willing customers so he can feed his family as the scum of the earth, while you see the hypocrite who gives away stolen money in the name of government as a saint. You see the guy who tries to avoid being robbed by the federal thugs as a crook and a tax cheat but see as virtuous the politician who gives away the same stolen loot to people to whom it does not belong. You see the cop as a good guy when he drags a man away from his friends and family and throws him in prison for 10 years for smoking a leaf. And you see anyone who defends himself from such barbaric fascism as the lowest form of life, a cop killer. In reality, most drug dealers are more virtuous than any government social worker and prostitutes have far less to be ashamed of than political whores because they trade only with what is rightfully theirs and only with those who want to trade with them. The upstanding, church-going, law-abiding, tax-paying citizen who votes Democrat or Republican is far more despicable and a bigger threat to humanity than the most promiscuous, lazy, drug-snorting hippie. Why? because the hippie is willing to let others be free and the voter is not. The damage done to society by bad habits and loose morality is nothing compared to the damage done to society by the self-righteous violence committed in the name of the state. You imagine yourselves to be charitable and tolerant when you are nothing of the sort. Even the Nazis had table manners and proper etiquette when they weren't killing people. You think you're good people because you say please and thank you? You think sitting in that big building on Sunday makes you noble and righteous? The difference between you and a common thief is that the thief has the honesty to commit the crime himself while you whine for government to do your stealing for you. The difference between you and the street thug is that the thug is open about the violence he commits while you let others forcibly control your neighbors on your behalf. You advocate theft, harassment, assault, and even murder, but accept no responsibility for doing so. You old folks want the government to steal from your kids so you can get your monthly check. You parents want all your neighbors to be robbed to pay for your kids' schooling. You all vote for whichever crook promises to steal money from other people to pay for what you want. You demand that those people who engage in behaviors you don't approve of be dragged off and locked up, but feel no guilt for the countless lives your whims have destroyed. You even call the government thugs your representatives, and yet you never take responsibility for the evil they commit. You proudly support the troops as they kill whomever the liars in D.C. tell them to kill, and you feel good about it. 
You call yourselves Christians or Jews or claim to follow some other religion. But the truth is what you call your religion is empty window dressing. What you truly worship, the God you really bow to, what you really believe in is the state. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder, unless you can do it by way of government. Then it's just fine, isn't it? If you call it taxation and war, it stops being a sin, right? After all, it was only your God that said you shouldn't steal and murder, but the state said it was okay. It's pretty obvious which one outranks the other in your minds. Despite all the churches, synagogues, and mosques we see around us, this nation has one God and only one God, and that God is called government. Jesus taught nonviolence and told you to love your neighbor, but the state encourages you to vote for people who will use the violence of government to butt into every aspect of everyone else's life. Which do you believe? To those about to stone a woman who had committed adultery, Jesus said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. But the state says it's perfectly fine to lock someone up if they do something you find distasteful, such as prostitution. Which do you believe? The Christian God says, thou shalt not covet, but coveting is the lifeblood of the beast that is the state. You are taught to resent, despise, and hate anyone who has anything you don't have. You clamor for the state to tear other people down, steal their property, and give it to you. And you call that fairness. The Bible calls it coveting and stealing. You are not Christians. You are not Jews. You are not Muslims. And you certainly aren't atheists. You all have the same God, and its name is government. You're all members of the most evil, insane, destructive cult in history. If there ever was a devil, the state is it and you worship it with all your heart and soul. You pray to it to solve every problem, to satisfy all your needs, to smite your enemies and to shower its blessings upon you. You worship what Nietzsche called the coldest of all cold monsters and you hate those of us who don't. To you, the greatest sin is disobeying your God, breaking the law, you call it, as if anyone could possibly have any moral obligation to obey the arbitrary commands and demands of the corrupt, lying, delusional megalomaniacs who infest this despicable town. Even your ministers, priests, and rabbis, more often than not, are traitors to their own religions, teaching that the commands of human authority should supersede adherence to the laws of the gods they say they believe in. Several years ago, I heard one pompous evangelical jackass in particular pontificating on the radio that anyone who disobeys the civil authority, be it a king or any other government, is engaging in rebellion against God. Those were the exact words he used. What if the government is doing something wrong? Well, this salesman for Satan opined, that is the business of those in government, and you are still obligated to obey. Everywhere you turn, be it the state or the church, the media or the schools, you are taught one thing above all else, the virtue of subjugating yourselves to mortals who claim to have the right to rule you. It is sickening the reverence with which you speak of the liars and thieves whose feet are so firmly planted on your necks. You call the congressmen and the judges honorable and you swoon at the magnificence of the grandiose halls they inhabit, the temples they built to celebrate the domination of mankind. You feel pride at being able to say you once shook a senator's hand or saw the president in person. Ah yes, the grand deity himself, his royal highness, the president of the United States of America. You speak the title as if you're referring to God Almighty. The vocabulary has changed a bit, but your mindset is no different from that of the groveling peasants of old who bowed low, faces in the dirt, with a feeling of unworthiness and humility when in the presence of whatever narcissist had declared himself to be their rightful lord and master. The truth of the matter back then and today is that these parasites who call themselves leaders are not superior beings. They are not great men and women. They are not honorable. They're not even average. The people who earn an honest living from sophisticated millionaire entrepreneurs to illiterate day laborers doing the most menial tasks you can imagine, 
Those people deserve your respect. Those people you should treat with courtesy and civility. But the frauds who claim the right to rule you and demand your subservience and obedience, they deserve only your scorn and contempt. Those who seek so-called high office are the lowest of the low. They may dress better, have larger vocabularies, and do a better job of planning out and executing their schemes, but they are no better than pickpockets, muggers, and carjackers. In fact, they are worse, because they don't want to rob you of just your possessions. They want to rob you of your very humanity, deprive you of your free will, by slowly leeching away your ability to think, to judge, to act, reducing you to slaves in both body and mind. And still you persist in calling them leaders. Leaders? Where is it that you think you're going exactly that would require you to have a leader? If you just live your own life and mind your own damn business, exercising your own talents, pursuing your own dreams, striving to be what you believe you should be, what possible use would you have for a leader? Do you ever actually think about the words that you hear, the words that you repeat? You parrot oxymoronic terms such as the leader of the free world. Even pretending for a moment that there is some huge journey or some giant battle that everyone in the entire nation is undertaking together that would require a leader. Why would you ever think, even for a moment, that the crooks that infest this town are the sort of people you should listen to or emulate or follow anywhere? Somewhere inside your mostly dormant brains, you know full well that politicians are all corrupt liars and thieves, opportunistic con men, exploiters and fear mongers. You know all this, and yet you still speak as if you are the ones who are the stupid vicious animals, while the politicians are the great wise role models, teachers and leaders without whom civilization could not exist. You think these crooks are the ones who make civilization possible? What belief could be more absurd? Yet when they do their pseudo-religious rituals deciding how to control you this week, you still call it law and continue to treat their arbitrary demands as if they were moral decrees from the gods that no decent person would ever consider disobeying. You have become so thoroughly indoctrinated into the cult of state worship that you are truly shocked when the occasional sane person states the bleeding obvious. The mere fact that the political crooks wrote something down and declared their threats to be law does not mean that any human being anywhere has the slightest moral obligation to obey. Every moment of every day, in every location and every situation, you have a moral obligation to do what you deem to be right not what some delusional bloated windbag says is legal. And that requires you to first determine right and wrong for yourself, a responsibility you spend much time and effort trying to dodge. You proclaim how proud you are to be law-abiding citizens and express your utter contempt for anyone who considers himself above your so-called laws, laws that are nothing more than the selfish whims of tyrants and thieves. The word crime once meant an act harmful to another person. Now it means disobedience to any one of the myriad of arbitrary commands coming from a parasitical criminal class. To you, the term crime is nearly synonymous with the word sin, implying that the ones whose commands are being disobeyed must be something akin to gods, when in truth they are more akin to leeches. The very phrase, taking the law into your own hands, perfectly expresses what a sacrilege it is in your eyes for a mere human being to take upon himself the responsibility to judge right from wrong and to act accordingly instead of doing what you do, unthinkingly obeying whatever capricious commands this cesspool of maggots spews forth. You glorify this criminal class as lawmakers and believe that no one is lower than a lawbreaker someone who would dare disobey the politicians. Likewise, you speak with pious reverence of law enforcers, those who forcibly impose the politicians every whim upon the rest of us. When the state uses violence, you imagine it to be inherently righteous and just, and if anyone resists, they are, in your eyes, 
contemptible lowlifes, lawless terrorist criminals. Like the lawless terrorist criminals who helped slaves escape the plantations. Like the lawless terrorist criminals who helped Jews escape the killing machine of the Third Reich. Like the lawless terrorist criminals who were crushed to death under the tanks of the Red Chinese government in Tiananmen Square. Like all the lawless terrorist criminals in history who had the courage to disobey the never-ending stream of tyrants and oppressors who have called their violence authority and law. And that includes the lawless terrorist criminals who founded this country. Everything you think you know is upside down, backwards and inside out. But what has to take the cake, the height of your insanity, is the fact that you view as violent terrorists the only people on the planet who oppose the initiation of violence against their fellow men. Anarchists, voluntarists and libertarians. We use violence only to defend ourselves against someone who initiates violence against us. We use it for nothing else. Meanwhile, your belief system is completely schizophrenic and self-contradictory. On the one hand, you teach the young slaves that violence is never the answer. Yet out of the other side of your mouths, you advocate that everyone and everything, everywhere and at all times be controlled, monitored, taxed and regulated through the force of government. In short, you are teaching your children that the masters may use violence whenever they please, but the slave should never resist. You indoctrinate your children into a life of unthinking, helpless subservience. You are putting the chains around their little necks and fastening the locks tight. And worst of all, you feel good about it. Out of one side of your mouths, you condemn the evils of fascism and socialism and lament the injustices of the regimes of Hitler, Stalin and Mao. While out of the other side of your mouths, you preach exactly what they did. The worship of the collective, the subjugation of every individual to that evil insanity that wears the deceptive label, the common good. You babble on and on about diversity and open-mindedness and then beg your masters to regulate and control every aspect of everyone's lives, creating a giant herd of unthinking conformist drones. You wear different clothes and have different hairstyles and you think that makes you different. Yet all your minds are enslaved to the same club of masters and controllers. You think what they tell you to think and do what they tell you to do while imagining yourselves to be progressive, thinking and enlightened. From your position of relative comfort and safety, you now condemn the evils of other lands and other times while turning a blind eye to the injustices happening right in front of you. You tell yourself that had you lived in those other places, in those other times, you would have been among those who stood up against oppression and defended the downtrodden. But that is a lie. You would have been right there with the rest of the flock of well-trained sheep, loudly demanding that the slaves be beaten, that the witches be burned, that the nonconformists and rebels be destroyed. How do I know this? Because that is exactly what you are doing today. Today's injustices and oppressions are fashionable and popular, and those who resist them, you tell yourselves, are just malcontents and freaks, people whose rights don't matter, people who deserve to be crushed under the boot of authority. Isn't that right? You bunch of spineless, unthinking hypocrites, look in the mirror. Take a good look at what you imagine to be righteous and kind. You are the devil's plaything. The crowds of thousands wildly applauding the speeches of Adolf Hitler, that was you. The mob demanding that Jesus Christ be nailed to the cross, that was you. The white invaders who celebrated the wholesale slaughter of those godless redskins, that was you. The throngs filling the Colosseum, applauding as the Christians were fed to the lions, that was you. Throughout history, the perpetual suffering and injustice occurring on an incomprehensible scale. It was all because of people just like you. 
the well-trained, thoroughly indoctrinated conformists, the people who do as they're told, who proudly bow to their masters, who follow the crowd, believing what everyone else believes and thinking whatever authority tells them to think, that is you. And your ignorance is not because the truth is not available to you. There have been radicals preaching it for thousands of years. No, you are ignorant because you shun the truth with all your heart and soul. You close your eyes and run away when a hint of reality lands in front of you. You condemn as extremists and fringe kooks those who try to show you the chains you wear because you don't want to be free. You don't even want to be human. Responsibility and reality scare the hell out of you, so you cling tightly to your own enslavement and lash out at any who seek to free you from it. When someone opens the door to your cage, you cower back in the corner and yell, close it, close it. Well, some of us are finished with trying to save you. We've wasted enough effort trying to convince you that you should be free. All you ever do is spout back what your masters have taught you, that being free only leads to chaos and destruction, while being obedient and subservient leads to peace and prosperity. There are none so blind as those who will not see. And you, you nation of sheep, would rather die than see the truth. There is something I need you to do, favorite, like and share this video. Now that you have done that, go to your browser add-ons, download YouTube video downloader, come back to this video and save the video to your computer and upload it to your YouTube channel. Use a different title than the one used for this video. We now have a new YouTube channel, it is called Anarchy World. It's all one word. Subscribe to us. And the videos used in this video were by Larkin Rose. Also one word, look for his channel and subscribe to him as well. Thank you. And by the way these are the people responsible.